to UCF Imprint. I'm Alice Collier. Need help? And who doesn't these days? Well, you might want to follow the advice of Lisa Maria. She's an advice columnist like no other. Dear Abby may claim to give common sense advice, but Lisa Maria gives us practical and witty insight. This feisty, fictitious character is the creation of my guest, UCF Associate Professor of English, Dr. Susan Hubbard. Dr. Hubbard has written several books, including Lisa Maria's Guide for the Perplexed and Lisa Maria Takes Off. As impressive, Dr. Hubbard was recently named among the 20 coolest people in Orlando. Welcome, Susan. Can I touch the hem of your garment? <laughs> How, how'd you get to be so cool? <laughs> Can I have your necklace? <laughs> Uh, that was a mystery to me. I'm sure it's a mistake. And uh, I mean, an English professor being cool, there's some, that's an oxymoron. That, that, that doesn't happen. Well, you are. You've written cool books. Tell us about Lisa Maria. I, I read them, and I adore her. Thank you. Um, you either love her or hate her, I think. I don't think anybody can be indifferent to her. She's a woman down on her luck, I'll say. She's someone who has just been fired in the first book from her advertising job in New York City. She retreats to upstate New York to a fictitious town called New Sparta, which is not my hometown <laughs> okay. at all of Syracuse, New York. And she gets a job as a maid um, cleaning other people's houses, which scandalizes her mother who thinks it's beneath a college-educated woman to do menial household chores. But she's chores. trying to make a living. She's trying to figure out how to live herself by snooping on the people she works for. She's learning a little bit about how she doesn't want to be. So that's where it begins. Um, in time, she takes on an advice column for a weekly paper, an alternative paper in Syracuse, oh, New Sparta, which is <laughs> nothing like the Syracuse New Times where I once freelanced. Um, <laughs> And she writes this weekly advice column and uh, finding that in her own problems, somehow there is the kind of wisdom that can help other people lead fine, upstanding lives, or so she thinks. Okay, Susan, how much of Lisa Maria is you? None. Really? None. I've never worked as a maid. Um, I've never lived in New Sparta. I lived in Syracuse, <laughs> not the same place. Um, sensibility, she does and says things that nice people like me would never say or do. <laughs> and well, you, I mean, and that's part of the fun of reading her and writing her, is it gives me the kind of poetic license to um, snoop, lie, cheat, steal, and do all the other things fictional characters do, but <laughs> no right. one we know would ever, <laughs> ever do it all. So it's, it's a little cathartic to write about her. I, I bet. So how did you develop her? If you're nothing like her, how did you, how did you come up with her? With most literary characters, I think the, um, the principle is composite creation. That is, um, physically, Lisa Maria reminds me of a woman I worked with in uh, upstate New York many years ago. Uh, emotionally, she reminds me of another woman I went to high school with. Uh, and psychologically, there is an element of me, of course. My sensibility is present in some of her tastes. And her, but in her outrageous behavior, I, I, I swear she's unique. Um, I don't <laughs> think anybody would do all the things that she does and get away with them so nicely. Well, read a bit about her. Sure. I'm going to read a bit from the first book, which is um, explains why Lisa Maria ended up at home. <laughs> the news at the Marino house was that the older daughter, Lisa Maria, had come back to New Sparta for an extended stay. Something had happened to her advertising job at McVeigh Moore in New York City. Not her fault. Blame it on downsizing. She hadn't managed to jump ship in time. So Lisa Maria had come home for a while to her old bedroom with the darling dormer windows. How nice for the Marino family to have this reunion with their older daughter. Well, that's what Mrs. Marino hoped the neighbors were saying, and it's more or less what Lisa heard her mother tell someone over the upstairs telephone. Mrs. Marino perched in the hallway using the princess phone on the mahogany telephone table with a built-in seat, and Lisa Maria creeping up the carpeted staircase, eavesdropping. She sat on the hooked rug that covered most of her bedroom floor, feeling dizzy with inertia, thinking back over her adult life. She saw certain repetitions of behavior that did not please her. There was the, this is the job I really want pattern. There was the, this is the man I really want pattern. And then there was the catastrophe is imminent flee pattern. 
All of these behaviors intertwined in a greater, more complex design that Lisa had of late begun to consider Byzantine bordering on the sinister. She stared up at the walls of her room, painted pink, a dreadful take me to the prom pink. <laughs> Lisa had chosen the color herself when she was 14, when her wavy dark hair fell nearly to her waist, and she'd spent whole days planning her romantic future. Something obviously had been overlooked in those plans. From a shelf over her bed, a collection of dolls in international costumes gazed toward the opposite wall. Their costumes differed greatly, as did their skin tones and hair colors, but all the dolls had identical facial features and bodies. They stood in neat rows, like toy soldiers ready to do battle. Her first boyfriend had given her the dolls, convinced that girls liked that sort of thing. Lisa never bothered to set him straight, so every Christmas and birthday she had pretended to appreciate another doll. Ah, oh, Miss Indonesia, how cute! But the sight of the dolls struck her now as intolerable. She pulled them, one after another, off the shelf and threw them into her wicker trash basket. Lisa Maria was disposing of Miss Holland when her mother came in. Mrs. Marino took one look and walked right out again. <laughs> and that begins the battle between Lisa and Mrs. Marino, not only over the dolls, but over what Lisa's going to do with her life. Well, Mrs. Marino has three cats, and I like it because Lisa Maria wants to give them all away to her ex-boyfriends. Yes. I think <laughs> Especially when she shows up in the politician's <laughs> office, one of the, the, one of the future, the wannabe mayors of, of New Sparta, and <laughs> says, here's a cat, it'll make you more popular with the voters. <laughs> <laughs> what is, how, how did you go about, find, you found her from different people. Yes. What made you sit down and write a story about her? Actually, it came in a dream. I, I woke up one morning, and this would be probably 90, 1993, and I had a character's voice in my head, and that happens quite a bit with writing, I find, that um, I'll wake up with an image or a voice or even a situation, and it will inspire a story, and in the end, the story often doesn't look or resemble anything in the dream closely, but something in the dream gives me notion. In this case, it was a voice. It was a literal voice, and I heard a young woman's voice saying, I don't know how to live. How do I figure this out? Know? And I remembered being in my 20s thinking, how, well, how are you supposed to do this? Oh, yeah. You know, you get out of college, you get your first job maybe. And uh, then what? And then what? And, and how do people do this? It's a mystery. Nobody really tells you. Um, so in, in a sense, I, I started playing with a voice on paper. And it ended up being a short story. And I gave it to my two daughters to read because they're often... Now go back, go back, go yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm into this dream now. Okay. So you, you, do you wake up and do you write it down immediately so you'll I try to, yeah, always. Okay. I even have a, a pen with a built-in um, flashlight next really? to my bed. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I don't have to wake up the other guy. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> because you don't want to lose things. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if you're like me, but I get brilliant ideas at 4 a.m., mm -hmm. and sometimes I write them down and they prove not to be brilliant, but often I wake up not having written them down, convinced that they were. And in fact, at one point, I dreamed an ending to the first book. And this is when I was um, at a writer's residency in upstate New York called Yaddo. And I didn't write it down. And the next day, it was gone. And I was convinced that was, that was the ending. So always write down anything that comes to you in Where a dream. Where do you think these dreams come from? I'm not a Freudian. So I don't believe, as he does, that creativity is repression. <laughs> well, he believes that all creative writers, <laughs> right. you know, we're all repressed right, individuals. Right. I don't believe that. I think there's something called imagination, which Freud mm -hmm. didn't pay many, much attention to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the ability to look at things which you can't quite figure out and then imagine you know, the motivation, imagine the background information, imagine the circumstances that it could have produced a character who would do th a certain mm -hmm. thing, say. Um, so for me, it's you know, taking character A's appearance character B's behavior, um, coming up with a name which I just like the sound of, Lisa Maria Marino, mm -hmm. putting it all together and then just seeing what happens and writing it, not knowing where it's going. Really? Yeah. So you just sat down and started writing? Sat down and started writing and uh, ended up with a short story which was published in um, Southern California Anthology, which is a magazine that University of Southern California puts out. And I would do uh, readings. I was teaching in California as a visiting writer in 95, just before I came here. 
And uh, I would read that story and people would come up. I mean, always got laughs. People loved Lisa Maria. I'm Lisa Maria. You know, 20 year old <laughs> men would say this. I'm Lisa Maria. Yeah, that's, that's scary. <laughs> well, no, everybody's got a little Lisa Maria in them. But um, uh, one person came up to me and said, that's a great first chapter. And I said, no, that's a short story. And he said, no, that's a first chapter. And then that started percolating. The light went off. I thought, you know, it's not a very good short story because it's got a whole lot of stuff going on that doesn't really get resolved. So maybe I should play with this as a novel. And I had not, at that point, written a novel. I'd written a part of a novel in which nothing much happened, which I'd put on the shelf. So I thought, okay, we'll see, let's see how to do this. So I learned sort of by reverse process. And you know, some people tell you that you need to have a grandiose scheme and you need to have a chapter outline or a synopsis before you even mm -hmm. start. Um, the first book, all I did was play it by ear. And I would write my synopsis after I wrote a chapter. I'd say, oh, I've got to remember this one took, this chapter took place in January. These were the important events. These characters were on stage. These characters were off. And I had index cards charting my chapters <laughs> after they were written. And I'd stick them up in the wall in a kind of an arc or not. If the arc wasn't there, I'd juggle, put chapter 14 back in chapter 11's place, that kind of thing. How long did it take you to write the first one? Oh, dear. All in all, two and a half years. Um, I, I finished a version of it. I sent it to my then agent. Um, writers and agents are sort of like any other relationship. You know, mm -hmm. they have their <laughs> comings and goings. And that was agent number two, whom I remember fondly. Um, but she couldn't sell it. And then she suggested some changes, or rather an editor who was interested in the book suggested some major changes, such as killing a character I loved. Mm. I killed the character. I played around. I sent it back. The agent had quit, or the editor had quit, rather. The agent was still there, but the editor had retired or gone off to have a baby, and uh, so her publishing house was no longer interested in it. Oh. So then I revived. I didn't revive that character, but I made a third major revision mm -hmm. and um, got a, uh, agent number three, who, who was a wonderful woman, Marcy Posner, and I met her in New York. And at lunch with her, I pitched the idea for a sequel totally mm. off the top of my head, had not written a word. And she said, I think I can sell these books. She said, a two book contract is always better than a one book contract. And within a month, she had sold both of them. And then I mm. had the situation of having book number two accepted, but nothing, not even a synopsis. <laughs> just, <It wasn't. laughs> just a little game at lunch I played with myself. Well, what if Lisa went, let's, go, let's put her in London. I like London, yeah. I've lived in London, let's send her over there. But uh, that second book was written more or less on deadline. I had a year to deliver, and I met my deadline. Now, you have Lisa Maria as an advice columnist, um, and I'm going to read this. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Dear Lisa Maria, I always seem to end up with men who want a mother. Is this my fault or theirs? Muddled in manil manilasis? Manlius. Manlius. They're all actual names of upstate New York oh. towns. Yeah. Dear Muddled, what's wrong with wanting a mother? The real question is, what do you want? LM. Isn't that wise? Very wise. <laughs> <laughs> Very wise. And and she gives advice like this. It's it's real good. Now where did you come up with the advice? Oh, I made it up, but I had inspiration. Um this I collect old etiquette manuals. I brought some with me just for fun. Um, and Lisa quotes from them in the book. Our deportment is one, mm -hmm. um, which has an interesting piece of advice that I thought I'd share with you. Never ask impertinent questions. Some authorities in etiquette even go so far as to say that all questions are strictly taboo. Thus, if you wish to inquire after the health of the brother of your friend, you say, I hope your brother is well, not how is your brother? <laughs> so you should not be asking any questions. Okay. We should be sh <laughs> making declarative sentences. This book is the one that I fell in love with. I found it when I was in my 20s, um, and it's out of print now. It was published in 1936. Marjorie Hillis's Live Alone and Like It. And the reason I love the book is that it celebrates um, living alone, celebrates it, mm -hmm. makes it out not to be a pitiable, pitiable mm -hmm. condition, which in 1936 many women thought it, mm -hmm. it, it could be. Um, 
and uh, which many women in 2005 think it should be. Many so. women, many men just <laughs> right. think being alone is no fun. But she says there's a way to do it with style and a way to celebrate your life. And so when I had to um, come up with advice for characters, I often read her. She has um, little case studies at the end of um, every chapter where she talks about um, the case of Miss J, the sad story of a young woman who sees herself as a martyr and has never noticed that however appealing the role may be to the player, it is a terrible bore to everyone else. Miss J gets the small end of everything, always the worst seat on the bus. <laughs> Just try to give her anything else. She lives all, all alone, which is somehow dreadfully pathetic for Miss J, although a rather pleasant thing for others. And she lives in the family mausoleum, surrounded by an aura of virtue and relics of the days. She seems to be in chronic mourning for all the relatives who've died within her memory. We would enjoy giving Miss J and her house a thorough airing. <laughs> and she comes up with actual tips for, you know, how to set up your house, how to have a social life, how to be an interesting person instead of, you know, a boring person. And I think there's a place for books like this mm -hmm. and I think there's a place for books like mine which actually try to make some of these more archaic forms of manners um, at least a matter of discussion for people because I don't know if you've noticed but rudeness is very much in vogue oh right yeah now. oh sure and road rage um, and uh, bad phone manners disrespect people talking on cell phones in public places um, you know it's just to me it's terribly rude I think I'm, I'm very Victorian in some part of me, um, where I just can't imagine why anybody would want to share intimate details of their lives with strangers in an airport. Well, you said a word that I found really fascinating. I mean, you used the word intimate, intimate details. And so when I, you first, when I first picked up the book, I thought, uh-oh, this is going to be like, you know, a young woman's book, and it's going to be, you know, very detailed and very sexy and all that. It's none of that. It's not sexy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's not it's not a romance novel. Oh hell no! No, it's not a genre it's not. book. It's not. I it mean, not. It, its cover looks like a genre book. I think it is in good taste. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very I'm good very taste. Very flattered. Thank you. And I would give this to you know my nieces and my girlfriends because I have boys. But I would give this to young women. This is good. Um, for example, um, Lisa Maria this, in the second book she goes to London to visit her boyfriend. So she sees him. And the next thing we, um, you, you in the chapter, or there's a line, I think, and then the next thing you, they wake up in the morning. And I thought that was very tasteful. Well, I, I'm not, I don't like to read graphic sex scenes. I mean, I just don't. It's not my taste. And writing them, to me, would just be silly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, I like sex. But writing about it is something yeah. better left to the imagination. Well, and obviously Lisa Maria does too, because yeah. she, you know, she doesn't discuss that. No, 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 no. no. She could. <laughs> I might probably sell about another hundred thousand books I know, if she I was did. Say. <laughs> if we put a nude Lisa You're Maria on the cover, I'm sure that it'd sell a few That's more right. too. That's but you right. know. <laughs> now, where do you go from here? Are you going to write more in this? There's another one that could be written. Oh, well, well. Is it in your head? In, in part. I mean, I end that book uh, in London with Lisa Maria and her, her writer consort, whose name is McAllister, uh, at a moment of big possible decision. I can't be more specific because I would hate to ruin yeah. this. Um, but the repercussions of the decision I, I've already explored in my mind. I know where I want to go with it. And I've actually had some people call me or email me who've read the second book and mm -hmm. say, so what happens next? And I say, well, you know, I know. <laughs> and if, um, if the second book sells as well as the first book, there might be a third, yeah. But and also, I thought it was real interesting that you said in the book, I guess if there's a moral to the story, it is that life isn't fair, but it's the unfairness that makes life interesting. Yeah. I like that. I like it too. And I like the idea that if you're looking for the way to do anything, you're probably not going to find it. You stumble on the best lessons in life through indirection, I find. At least it's been true for me. Um, it's kind of a Zen way of looking at the world. If you have, you know, if you go out in the morning and say, well, today I'm going to find truth and beauty, not likely it's mm -hmm. going to happen. But if you simply go about your routine, you know, think back on the times in, in your life when you've been happiness, happiest. They don't come when you've planned, in my life anyway, the big 
dinner with mm -hmm. a big romantic evening, they come out of nowhere. They come by almost accident. You forget about things and you're just bumbling along and then somebody does something unexpectedly graceful and beautiful and you just bowled over. Those are the moments of enlightenment, I think, for most of us in our ordinary lives. So seeking um, the answer is the best way to end up confused and perplexed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Having lived through my 20s and 30s, I agree. <laughs> Of course, in your 40s, it gets better. <laughs> yes, it is better. It gets a whole lot better. <laughs> it is better. Now, do you see this as a TV series or a movie? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I've dreamed about it, and friends have contributed names of actresses and actors who'd be likely cast. You know, we all uh, wanted... Um, there's a, a rock and roll star in the second book who's got to be Johnny Depp. Yeah. I'm sorry he's yeah. got to be Johnny Depp. <laughs> um, because when I wrote him, I was looking at Johnny Depp in my mind. So Johnny Depp is hit. But um, yeah, and I have um, uh, some prospects. But as we were talking about earlier off camera, um, you never can count on uh, even an optioned book being made into a screenplay and then the screenplay actually being made into a movie. And as somebody who's married to a sometime screenwriter, I know that part <laughs> of, of the world. You just don't count on it. So, oh, of course I could imagine oh, it yeah. happening because I think, I think it's, it's funny enough. And it, it has its moments of perception that would justify a film or a TV show. But, you know, we're waiting. Yeah. We'll uh, wait a see. TV series. TV series would be great. Yeah. yeah. Ongoing. Yeah. She's got to give more advice. It's yeah. good advice. I like the advice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us, you've written other things oh, as yes. well and, and won some super awards. Tell us about, like, Walking on Ice. Walking on Ice was my first book, and um, it actually was my uh, master's thesis at Syracuse, where I was a graduate student, um, much revised, but it won the Associated Writing Programs. Um, prize for short fiction and was published. And really that was a great breakthrough for me because um, I was teaching as a lecturer at Cornell University when this book came out. I was teaching engineers how to write proposals mm. and do presentations, which, which I quite enjoyed. And I was teaching creative writing also, but only a few classes here and there. Uh, so this book was a kind of breakthrough. It, it made me think, well, I think I'll go on the job market and uh, lo and behold, uh, after a year as a writer in residence at California, I went on the market and came to uh, UCF. So um, this one won the AWP Prize, Blue Money, um, which was, I think, published in 99, won something called the Janet Heidegger Kafka Prize for the best book published that year by an American woman. And mm. Toni Morrison and Gail Godwin, I mean, a number of wonderful writers have won that prize. So that was a Quite gift, a great a gift, yeah. What's Blue Money about? Blue Money is short stories as is Walking on Ice, but um, Walking on Ice was written when I was uh, living in upstate New York. I had two young children and I was near the end of a very unhappy 13-year year marriage. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of coldness in these stories. This is the book that I began to thaw. <laughs> I was um, living in California and then in Florida um, and I think I see a kind of greater warmth both in the styles and in the characterizations of these stories. Uh, but they're realistic short stories. They're about women and men um, struggling to figure out how to trust other women and men hmm. and set in contemporary places. Um, again, upstate New York, Boston, Scotland. Uh, I lived in Northern Ireland for a while. Each of these books has a story that was set in Northern Ireland as well. Now you're teaching creative writing on a graduate level. And right. undergraduate, both, yeah, yeah. at UCF. Tell us about this new program that you're going to have. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, ever since I came to UCF in 95, there was talk about um, converting a master's to a, a master's of fine arts program in creative writing. Why that's important is the MFA is um, considered a terminal degree, which means that our students have a more competitive edge in the job market. Quite honestly, in terms of what the actual degree programs are, there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of content. Uh, both graduate programs focused on writing workshops and some classes in form and theory of writing. But um, we've expanded the curriculum just a bit with the MFA, which was approved unanimously by the UCF Board of Trustees in March. Mm. And our first crew of MFA candidates will begin classes uh, in uh, August. So it's it's tremendously exciting. It'll make us able to attract students from a, a national pool mm -hmm. instead of a regional one. 
um, although we've, al we've already begun that. And um, it's going to let us uh, become a player, really, in the national uh, graduate MFA program game, if you will. And uh, I'm very, I, it took forever to get the thing, the proposal written and approved, but it was just uh, very satisfying to see that happen. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you, and congratulations to everybody at UCF who helped with it, because it was a lot of people working hard to produce a lot of information. Susan, what do you tell your students who want to, to be like you and to write books and novels and, and all kind of fiction? What do you tell them? How do they go about getting started? I think it's a, in a matter of having enough heart and stamina to succeed. When I was, uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer from the time I was 10. I can't tell you how many people tried to talk me out of it. I was told, you'll never make money, you'll never find a job, you'll never get published. You know, <laughs> we are a good writer, but the <laughs> odds are against it, and the, the odds are daunting. But if your heart is in this, then I think um, you're going to succeed eventually. It may take a while, because the literary marketplace is very grim right now. It's very hard to get a, a, a manuscript accepted. But um, if your heart tells you you have to be an artist, no matter what your persuasion is, you sh should listen to your heart. Otherwise, you'll end up in a safe career, and you'll be in your you know, late 20s, early 30s, and realize this isn't what I want to do with my life. Um, so I think it's important to first, you've got to have it in your heart. I, I want to be, I've got to be a writer, that's what I am. I spent 10 years as a newspaper reporter and columnist in between undergraduate and graduate school because I was told, this is safer. Well, no. <laughs> it was fun, I'm glad I did it. But at the end of that period, I got, I won my fiction prize and suddenly I was back in the realm that I'd wanted to be in all along. So I think it's important to a believe in yourself and your in your talent. Um, B be able to take criticism, mm. and that's why mm. writing that's workshops good. are valuable. That's good advice. You can't just write for yourself, even though we all do write for ourselves. But you have to be able to communicate something clearly to other people. And a workshop, a writing workshop, will show you pretty quickly how well that's going over. Because in a typical writing workshop, you'll have anywhere from fifteen to twenty mm -hmm. other students, other writers. They'll read what you've written, and they'll tell you what's working and what they think isn't. And they won't all agree, but among the voices, you'll be able to come up with a kind of consensus. And so then you learn the craft. You learn how to do setting. You learn how to build a character. You learn how to net the, not let the plot dominate the characters, and how to work in the theme, and all those little elements of craft which make a well-crafted story or novel. Well, Susan, I'm certainly glad you followed your heart and listened to those inner voices because Lisa Maria is certainly fascinating. Thank you. Again, her books are called Lisa Maria's Guide for the Perplex and Lisa Maria Takes Off. We thank Susan Hubbard so much for joining us today. That's our program for now. Thanks for watching UCF in Print. I'm Alice Collier. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.